Thank you. So um, in the few minutes that I have left, I will uh, t tell you about, about the carbon cycle. So uh, I had a research talk that I was, um, had proposed, but I understand because this is, this is the Department of Physics. Um, there are many kinds of physics, and so this is going to be uh, more like that communication to uh, public audiences kind of talk. Um, oh, now that's not working. Okay, so did I forget to turn something on, my, my friend? Oh, there's a little switch, yeah. Okay, uh, carbon, you, you guys know what carbon is, right? It's the sixth element in the periodic table. It's got protons, it's got neutrons, it's got electrons. It's made in stars. This is a star. This is Herschel's Garnet Star. I took this photograph on Sunday from my mountain cabin in Wyoming. Um, Herschel's Garnet Star is a red hypergiant star uh, in the, it's mu CPI. It's uh, about 2,000 parsecs away. It's a, uh, it's a huge star. It's, it's the diameter of the star is bigger than the uh, orbit of Jupiter. Um, and it's done uh, with, with its hydrogen and it's now fueling uh, itself by, by um, fusing helium into carbon. So this is where carbon is made. Carbon is made inside big stars um, towards the end of their lives. And um, so big stars come in galaxies. Galaxies, our galaxy has, has uh, spiral arms which are uh, waves of creation, they sweep through the gas and the dust of the galaxy. Uh, slight compression is enough to trigger uh, gravitational collapse and the creation of new stars. So there's actually not a whole lot more material in spiral arms than there is in the rest of the galaxy. But what's happening in spiral arms is that there's a lot of, of new stars being formed. And that's what you see with all those blue uh, things that trace the arms. And then the pink stuff is, is fluorescent gas that's uh, that's left there. The other thing that happens is that after those, um, those great big stars like Herschel's Garnet stars blow up, they leave stuff behind, right? So the stuff that they leave behind is often uh, accumulates in, in the disk of galaxies and that, that is dust. That is uh, mineral dust. It, it's very high temperature condensate. Um, really there are only about a dozen uh, kinds of crystals that can condense at those kind of uh, very, very high temperatures and low pressures. Um, but a lot of it is carbon. There's a tremendous amount of carbon that is left behind uh, as spiral density waves um, pass by and accumulates in the disk of, of the galaxy. I took this picture too um, last summer. This is the Milky Way, summer Milky Way, looking almost straight up from my cabin. And this black uh, rift through the middle of the Milky Way is, is largely carbon. There, there's a lot of carbon in space um, way more carbon in, in this picture than there is, say, in this room or uh, on this planet. There, there's a tremendous amount of carbon up there. This stuff is, is like soot, basically. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of organic uh, molecules, sticky, greasy, black soot in space, the, the, the gunk of, of the galaxy. Um, this is a, I didn't take this picture, this is a picture of a comet uh, from the Rosetta mission, um, you, you know, uh, they sent a, a probe to actually orbit a comet as it fell into the central part of the solar system. And what you see here is uh, a plume of gas and dust being, being, um, being shot out of the, co of the comet. This is the stuff that will eventually become the tail. A lot of that is CO2. CO2 and water vapor, ice and dry ice are major constituents of the universe and major constituents of the solar system. So carbon, of course, is also important um, for life. Um, it's, it's especially important for the chemistry of life uh, because it goes either way. It, it's the middle of the periodic table. You got four valence electrons. You can pick them up. You can give them back. You can hook carbon to almost anything. Uh, so organic chemistry in, on Earth is based on carbon. Uh, but there's something else important about carbon. And um, some of you who are around my age will remember this movie. Alive, it's alive, it's alive. So, so it's alive, right? This is, this is why carbon is special to us, is that um, we are made of, of living carbon. Carbon is the currency for life, for energy on Earth, plants, uh, photosynthesize, which is honestly, it's like a freaking miracle. 
Uh, gas diffuses into these little pores in the, in the bottoms of leaves, inorganic spent carbon. The, the last ashes of the carbon cycle, uh, the, the energy has all been wrung out of this stuff. It, it's just floating around fully oxidized and it diffuses into the base, the, the, the pores on the underside of the leaves. It dissolves into leaf water. It diffuses uh, into the chloroplast where energy from the sun is used to take that oxidized carbon and string it together like little beads into these long chain molecules and it's alive, right? It's going from, from literally dead gas to the, the, the living juice of life. And if it weren't for that process, uh, we wouldn't be here. All, all of the energy that I have to run around and wave my arms up here came, came from, from this process. Uh, all of the energy in all of our metabolism, this, this, is where, this is where it all comes from, is from photosynthesis. Now, of course, nearly all of that carbon gets released back to the atmosphere, right? Because uh, the, the creation of living material from, from inorganic gas, which is what photosynthesis does, is almost perfectly balanced by what we do, which is that we burn that, those organic matter, uh, molecules in our um, mitochondria and we, we release energy that drives our metabolism from that uh, photosynthetic energy. About one out of every seven carbon atoms in the atmosphere, one out of every seven CO2 molecules is fixed by photosynthesis every year. So in seven years time, Photosynthesis by itself would deplete the entire atmosphere of CO2 would be the end of the world. But, you know, luckily that's not the only thing going on, right? Because there's also uh, respiration. And the respiration therefore creates one seventh of all the CO2 in the atmosphere every year. There's this phenomenal rapid cycling between the atmosphere and the biosphere, about, about one seventh of it every year. Uh, now, um, a, a tiny fraction of the photosynthetic carbon does not go back into the atmosphere. And, and you've, you've seen these diagrams before, right? So a little bit of organic matter winds up getting buried in the bottom of a pond in this particular picture or the ocean or whatever. And over time, it may be very, buried very deep. And if those buried fossils uh, reach about 100 degrees Celsius for about a million years, then uh, chemical reactions can occur which lead to the formation of hydrocarbons in, in the uh, deep rock. So this has to happen quite far down where the pressures and temperatures are much higher. Uh, now, just like you have to um, y you know, shake a, uh, a bottle of uh, uh, oil and vinegar dressing because the, the, the oil will float on top of, the, of the, uh, the vinegar, so for exactly the same reason, the oil in the rocks will float upward uh, because it's less dense than the water in the rocks and wind up moving through the rocks until it reaches an impermeable layer. Um, eventually, flake tectonics can come along and fold the layers, and you wind up with these uh, uphill flows of oil and gas into uh, domes, into, into the uh, anticlines in, in the rocks, and then you know people come with pickup trucks and oil rigs and, uh, and, and, and dig this stuff out. Oh, I, I did forget. I, I was gonna hand out some, some samples of these things, but uh, ne never mind. you'll have to come back some other time when I do this talk somewhere else. Um, so what, what do we do with this stuff? Well, obviously we, we uh, mine it, we bring it out of the ground. Um, here's a, a hydrocarbon uh, molecule. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons and the rest hydrogens. That's an octane molecule. You've, you've heard of octane. You pump it into your gas tank. You uh, spray it into the cylinder head. You compress it 20 to one with a piston. Uh, you light it on fire and <laughs> out comes the energy, right? So this is the photosynthetic energy that was fixed um, millions, perhaps hundreds of millions of years ago by photosynthesis, now being used to accelerate your, uh, you know, your car on the, on the freeway or whatever. And if you do it right, then every carbon winds up uh, reacting with two oxygens. Every, uh, every hydrogen, pair of hydrogens reacts with another oxygen. And you get this pure CO2 and water vapor coming out with lots of energy. And the energy is, is what we use to drive civilization. So um, we're, we're all pretty familiar with this stuff. Um, in the 1820s, Fourier calculated that the Earth could not maintain a temperature above freezing um, based on solar radiation alone. There had to be some other source of, of heat uh, 
to keep the surface of the Earth warm enough. This is a, a paper in the 18, early 1820s. And he was the first to coin the greenhouse analogy, the idea that there's uh, some similarity between the gases in the atmosphere and the uh, selective transparency of glass that allows visible light to pass through but um, retards the, the propagation of, of infrared light. Um, by the 1860s, that greenhouse effect was quantified in the laboratory um, by John Tyndall, who made uh, direct measurements of infrared absorption in, in um, flasks with uh, lamps and, and detectors and was able to actually uh, show that CO2 and water vapor and other gases were selectively transparent, allowed the visible light to pass through but did not allow the, uh, the same transmission by infrared light. Arrhenius in the 1890s um, took those measurements and, and uh, other measurements and calculated that um, doubling the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere would raise the global average temperature by about three degrees Celsius, uh, w which is amazing. This is 1896. So um, it's not, not like, uh, you know, this was discovered by Al Gore. This, this is something that um, ha has been in the literature for quite some time. Um, in the 1930s, uh, the first sort of low precision global measurements of CO2 were made by Guy Callender, uh, an English steam engineer. Uh, at that point, they were measuring CO2 by um, bubbling air through water and then measuring the change in pH, trying to measure the uh, dissociation of the CO2 into carbonic acid. And, um, and this was barely uh, able to, to tell the difference from one place to another or one year to another in terms of the, the CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, precise measurements started in the 1950s by Dave Keeling at Scripps Univers uh, Institution of Oceanography in, in uh, San Diego. He developed an infrared analyzer that was able to uh, very quickly detect the rise in the CO2, the seasonal cycle of the CO2. And since 1959, uh, those measurements have been going on 24 hours a day, seven days a week at the top of a uh, big volcano in Hawaii, in the middle of the Pacific. Um, ba basically, since I was born, th this measurement has been made um, every hour of every day. And by 1961, Keeling had established this seasonal cycle at Mauna Loa uh, and had calculated that the rise, well, first of all, that CO2 was even rising. Be before these measurements in the late 1950s, it was generally uh, believed the pendulum had sort of swung from Arrhenius, who said doubling CO2 will warm the, the world, uh, to, to sort of mid 20th century, people thought, well, that's true, but it would be really hard to double CO2 because the CO2 will simply dissolve into the oceans. The, the solubility of CO2 in the oceans will, will bail us out from, from this. Um, so Keeling, very, very quickly, within, within a, a handful of years of the invention of the instrument, was able to show that the rise in CO2, CO2 was rising and that the rise, rate of rise of CO2 was only half the rate of fossil fuel combustion. Because fossil fuel combustion is quite well known I mean, people make billions of dollars buying and selling this stuff to each other, so that they, they, they keep good track. Um, and you can subtract the rate of increase of CO2 from the rate of combustion of, of carbon to uh, obtain a budget. Um, so we, we, we know that the oceans can react with CO2. We, we can measure the uh, chemistry of CO2 plus water goes to uh, carbonic acid, H2CO3, which dissociates into hydrogen ion and a, a bicarbonate ion. The bicarbonate ion can then dissociate again into another hydrogen ion and a carbonate ion. So I'm not gonna write all that down, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's basically the same chemistry as beer, okay? Or, or you know, Coca-Cola. Um, I don't drink beer anymore, and my wife got sick of buying me uh, Pellegrino, so she bought me one of these fizz machines for Christmas. Uh, and basically, this is just a tank of CO2, and you put tap water in there, and you go and it, you know, it makes the, uh, uh, we, we ate dinner last night, and Jing was there, uh, and they had this you know, carbonated water that, that at the restaurant, it goes good with cheese, okay? It, it, it like tickles your tongue a little bit, it's got that little bite of acidity, um, this is why we like beer and pizza together, it's why we like, you know, brie and, and chardonnay together, um, it, it actually works pretty good for, um, for CO2 and water, um, it works better in cold water than it does in warm water. This is why a beer will go flat. If you, if you, you know, stick a beer on a, on a kitchen table for too long, uh, it'll lose its fizz, and that's because it's warming up and the CO2 comes out of solution. Cold, cold water dissolves CO2 much better than warm water. 
uh, which means the cold polar oceans are really hungry for CO2. They suck up CO2 out of the atmosphere, but the warm tropical oceans uh, don't. So the CO2 dissolves into the polar oceans and it eventually comes back out uh, in, in the tropics. Um, when I was a little kid, something terrible happened. Um, the, the US and the Soviet Union used to blow off nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. Uh, and thank goodness, in uh, 1963, they, they agreed to stop doing that. So they, they signed a nuclear test ban treaty in 1963, and they said, we promise not to, to blow off any more nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. So what do you think they did for the next six months before the treaty went into effect? Yes, you guessed it. They blew off dozens of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere because it was going to be illegal in, in a few months. So there was this huge uh, increase in nuclear testing in 1964, uh, and that made a tremendous amount of radioactive CO2 of 14 CO2, um, much, much more than is produced by cosmic rays uh, in, in the atmosphere. So there was this very large anthropogenic pulse of radioactive CO2. Now, chemically and biologically, that CO2 is pretty much the same as any other CO2. The difference was all those little molecules had little stickers on their foreheads that said, I was made in 1964. So there, there was this tremendous, uh, pulse of, of labeled CO2 in 1964, and that has now been propagating through both uh, photosynthesis and through the chemistry of the oceans ever since 1964. Um, oceanographers went out in the 1970s and found it. And they found it at the surface of the ocean and they found places where the, the water was penetrating to depth and they were able to trace the 1964 bomb radiocarbon uh, through the carbon cycle of the ocean. And they were able very conclusively to show by about the mid 1970s that only about half of the missing carbon could be in the ocean. So, so let me sort of remind you, um, there's fossil fuel burning, and let's call that 100%, okay? We, we know how much fossil fuel is bought and sold in the world in a year, uh, quite accurately, from commercial records. Uh, we, we can directly measure the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere, and it turns out that's about 50% of the fossil fuel. The oceans, take up about 25% of the fossil fuel or half of the half that's not in the atmosphere. Uh, and we know that, among other reasons, from the bomb C-14, from the 1964 bomb tests that tagged uh, a large amount of CO2 and, and was later found um, in the oceans. And you add the fossil fuel minus the atmosphere minus the ocean and you're left with a residual of 25%, which came to be known as the missing sink. There's some extra place where the carbon is going. And you know, how many places are there? There's the air and there's the oceans. Where else is there? There's the land, right? So, so oddly, oceanographers declared that there was a land sink, that, that, that the land was taking up CO2. And it was, it was primarily atmospheric scientists and oceanographers who published these results in the 1970s. And ecologists uh, who work on the land heard this and they said, you, you've gotta be kidding. Um, not, not only is the, is the land not taking up CO2, but haven't you heard of you know, tropical deforestation and uh, cutting down the rainforests and paving paradise and putting up a parking lot and all this stuff. So, so th there was this big sort of controversy in the 1970s between atmospheric scientists and oceanographers on the one hand and, and uh, terrestrial biologists, ecologists on the other hand. Um, so the oceanographers sort of invented this, this land sink and uh, they basically reasoned like this. Plants eat CO2 for a living through photosynthesis, so adding CO2 to the air makes them eat more. It's like the Girl Scout cookies theory of dieting. If you put Girl Scout cookies in my house, I will gain biomass. Um, I, I, I tend to, to become larger when, when, when these things are around, and the atmosphere uh, was sort of adding food to, to the biosphere, and so the biosphere is bulking up. That, that's kind of the, the, the simplest uh, view of this. Um, so this is known as CO2 fertilization. And actually, in the laboratory and in greenhouses, you can show very easily that this really does occur. So here's an experiment, and I'm sorry you can't see the, the numbers on these plants. These are rice plants um, grown in controlled conditions at 30 parts per million of CO2, 40, 50, 60, 100. 400 is kind of the modern uh, amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. There used to be only 300 ppm of CO2 in the atmosphere, now there's 400 ppm. You can grow rice at 800 ppm, and you can see 
that as you add CO2 to the atmosphere, you get more and more biomass in, in these rice plants. Now, that's pretty straightforward. You can, you can do it in a test tube. You can do it in a greenhouse. Um, but all things must die, right? So, so uh, more growth pr produces more stuff, which then is more dead stuff, right? Um, I, I don't know if you guys watch Game of Thrones. M maybe the people don't do that around here. But uh, th there's a saying in Game of Thrones, Vala Mogulis, it means all men must die. And it's like, yeah, well, never mind. But, but uh, it is true that all, all things must, must die. Um, plants die, and eventually every bit of CO2 that goes into the extra plants b because of the extra CO2 in the atmosphere is going to come back. So it isn't necessarily all that clear that um, adding CO2 to the atmosphere will lead to more plants. You've you got to have stuff uh, go permanently into the plants, not just temporarily uh, wh while they're alive. Um, we know from ice cores, this is the year 1000 AD, so think like William the Conqueror. Um, you know, here's the Renaissance, and this is the CO2 in the atmosphere, and it was really steady for a really long time, for many millennia before the Industrial Revolution. The CO2 really didn't go up and down. Uh, it, it did, like, on Ice Age timescales, but that's a different talk. Uh, but, but here in the last couple of hundred years, the CO2 has spiked well over uh, by, by more than one third. Um, so, so this suggests that over long periods of time, over, over centuries and millennia, there's a balance between life and death, right? The growth of, of new living stuff is balanced by the decay of old dead stuff. This, this stands to reason. It kind of has to be on geologic timescales that, that there's some balance here. On the other hand, we know for sure because we can count that there's actually carbon passing from the atmosphere into the biosphere at the planetary scale. So when we say that the land is a carbon sink, we're not just saying that plants grow. We're saying that they're growing faster than they're dying. It's a remarkable thing to say. And nobody expected this to be the case. This was discovered in the 1970s, 1980s, and, and people were just aghast that, that plants could, in a sustained way over many decades, grow faster than they're dying, even though, uh, you, you know, we're, we're cutting down the rainforests and we're plowing the prairies and we're building Walmarts and we're doing all the stuff that, that we're doing. So, wow, how can that be? How, what, what about all that clearing? How can it be that plants are, are in a sustained way for at least the last 60 years that we've been making these measurements to sufficient precision to do the budget, wh what's going on here? Um, so if you think about uh, the sort of simplest back of the envelope model of, of the biosphere, plants take CO2 out of the atmosphere, they die and turn into litter. I mean, I guess we, we do that too, but we, we don't like to think about it. Um, the litter is eaten by microbes uh, to get the energy out of it, and they breathe off a whole bunch of CO2, and what they don't breathe off, they poop, and it becomes what we call soil carbon, and that's eaten by other microbes. I don't want to think about that either. But eventually, all this stuff kind of comes out. So, so the CO2 goes in, the CO2 comes out. Um, so, so when we say that there's more going in than coming out, we, we're somehow uh, putting the system out of balance here. Um, this is a model calculation from 20 years ago uh, showing back in the 19th century the amount of carbon going into growth and going into uh, death decomposition, so the carbon in and the carbon out of the biosphere, and both of them are increasing by this assumption, the sort of the Girl Scout assumption that I, that I talked about, where if you put more CO2 in the air, the growth increases, but then after some tau, some period of time, and, and people estimate this period of time, the lifetime of carbon in the biosphere, to be about 10 or 20 years. So that's like a weighted average of the bristlecone pines in the Sierras, and the blades of grass in my backyard after my dog pees on them or something. You know, there, there, there's, there's some uh, very fast turnover and very slow turnover, but on the average, the, the world turns over carbon in about 10 or 20 years. And because the decomposition is delayed relative to the growth, in any given year, the, the, the growth is ahead of the decomposition. So this is kind of the, the idea of the, the carbon fertilization of the biosphere, that the, the, yes, you're increasing the amount of dead stuff to decompose, but not yet. Y you know, there's this delay. Um, you can measure this in the field. These are face experiments. That's free air carbon enrichment. These are actually towers. Uh, there are about 50 of these sites around the world uh, where, where 
whole ecosystems are fumigated with extra CO2 and you can actually measure over a period of years the impact of different levels of CO2 on the growth of natural vegetation in the outdoors. It's quite an amazing thing. Um, never mind the detailed graph. What these, what these results show is that the extra bump you get from CO2 in most ecosystems is temporary. Okay, so, so um, those of you who are interested in the details come see me after, but, but basically what happens is you get maybe three or four or five or 10 years of um, increased growth in these, in these treated ecosystems, and then it kind of tails off. And it's commonly is interpreted as uh, running out of something else besides the CO2. So plants need nitrogen, they need phosphorus, they need potassium, they need water, they need light, they need all, you know, they need all kinds of stuff. Um, and if you don't give them extra of all those other things in the same proportion that you give them extra CO2, then eventually you run out of something else and, and you wind up kind of running out of the extra bump that you get from the CO2. And then if you sort of fertilize them at the end of that, you can get a, a second bump. So CO2 fertilization is still uh, somewhat um, dicey, but it turns out we're not just giving plants carbon, we're giving them nutrients too. Um, it used to be, um, before about 100 years ago, uh, well, this is kind of an aside, but uh, you, you know, we're made of proteins and proteins uh, have nitrogen in them. So nitrogen is, is uh, absolutely critical to life because biochemistry depends on proteins. And um, we can't use N2, which is 80% of the atmosphere. The only nitrogen we can use to make proteins and bi biology can use to make proteins is biologically um, reactive nitrogen, is, is chemically reactive. So you have to break the N2 molecule and uh, be able to free that up to be used in biosphere. And it used to be until 100 years ago that lightning was the major uh, production of, of uh, chemically reactive nitrogen in the biosphere. So all proteins came from, from lightning, which is pretty amazing. But um, Haber and Bosch in the early 20th century figured out how to um, extract nitrogen from the atmosphere using fossil fuel energy and that led to the Green Revolution, and this is why we can feed you know, seven billion people. We, we, we couldn't possibly have done it without uh, the ability to extract uh, nitrogen from, from the atmosphere. But um, as a, a, a byproduct, it, it's getting out. We, we are leaking um, bioavailable nitrogen all over the world through both intentional fertilizers, through, through uh, agriculture, but also through combustion. Because when you, you take your 20 to one compressed air in your, in your cylinder heads, in your engines, you actually burn some of the air. So the N2 plus the O2 become NO and NO2 and go out and become like miracle grow from the skies that, that rains down. And so in, in addition to giving them CO2, we're giving them, um, giving them nitrate from, from the skies. So we, we contribute to the, uh, to the sink like that. And this is sort of a map of nitrogen deposition, um, mostly downwind from industrial activity in, in the uh, Northern hemisphere. Um, Changing land use can also uh, actually take up some, some carbon. So uh, everybody knows that in, well, maybe not everybody, but I've always heard that, that we're cutting down forests left and right. I mean, this is sort of a guilt thing that, that people get uh, about, about deforestation. Um, but where I grew up in, in the northeastern part of the United States, so like uh, Massachusetts and New Hampshire, um, we would walk out into the forest and see these beautifully constructed stone walls out in the, in the woods. And these are closed canopy, you know, maple birch beech forests uh, in the northeastern US. So uh, you wonder what the heck was somebody doing to go to all the trouble to build this beautiful stone wall in the middle of the forest? Well, they didn't used to be forests, the, the, these places in Vermont. Uh, there was no forest in New England um, as recently as about 1850. And basically what happened was um, it became uneconomic to farm in those, those places. Agriculture moved to the middle of the continent. Um, people who lived in the northeastern part of the United States moved into town and got jobs and they let the trees grow back. So all of that wood that you've seen, um, I mean, outside of Toronto or, or uh, in the Maritimes or uh, New England, ev every molecule of wood used to be a CO2 molecule. So the, the regrowth of forests in the industrial world that followed the uh, demise of the family farm is a major sequestration uh, mechanism for, for carbon in the biosphere. Um, another thing that's going on is that uh, the Arctic is warming up and it's warming up three times the rate that the globe as a whole is warming up. So there's actually large areas of the, uh, the boreal and Arctic zones where there are 50% more frost-free days than there were 40 years ago. 
pretty impressive, actually. V very large, noticeable increases in the length of the growing season in the Arctic. And in a lot of those places, there is a statistically significant trend in the amount of chlorophyll and, and green stuff uh, up there. It's basically the, the northern tree line sort of uh, sh shrubbing into the, uh, into the tundra and also becoming more productive. So all, th all of these mechanisms uh, are, are occurring. There's the CO2 fertilization, the nitrogen fertilization, the regrowing forests in the formerly uh, agricultural parts of the world, and the um, longer growing season, uh, boreal warming, let's say. Uh, now, I have to talk a little bit about measurements. Um, what we, we measure carbon in the biosphere, in the atmosphere, in the oceans, in gigatons, okay? You guys know like gigabytes, right? Gigatons is a billion tons. A, a, a billion tons of, of, a billion tons is the mass of a cubic kilometer of water. If, if you had a, a, a kilometer wide by a kilometer long by a kilometer tall of, of pure water, that'd be precisely 10 to the nine tons. Um, now, a, a gigaton of carbon actually turns into almost four gigatons of CO2 because you have to weigh the oxygen as well. So this is kind of units conversion thing that often bites people. Um, but, but try to remember, gigatons are huge. Um, in the atmosphere, there's 800, 850 gigatons of carbon as, as CO2. But we dig up 10 gigatons a year of coal, oil, and gas carbon and set it on fire. So we're adding 10 gigatons of carbon to the atmosphere a year, but only five gigatons a year is showing up. Uh, the other five gigatons has gone missing, but it's really hard to find. It's hard to find because there's 120 gigatons a year of photosynthesis, and 120 gigatons a year of decomposition. So you're looking for five, but unfortunately these 120s have like error bars of 25 or 30 or 35. So uh, this is why I still have a job, is that the, the error bars are much bigger than the, than the signal we're looking for. The ocean also dissolves a whole bunch of CO2, like I said, in the, in the polar regions and gives it back in the tropics every year. Um, if you add it all up, since 1750, the fossil fuel cumulative is up there out to the, 20 teens, uh, the amount that's gone into the ocean, the amount that's gone into the air, the amount that has gone into the land. So, um, you, you know, land, air, and ocean, each taking up part of that fossil and deforestation carbon. The oceans are hard to measure because they're deep and dark. Um, I don't know if you've ever been scuba diving or uh, snorkeling, you know, if you, at snorkel depth, you can see all these beautiful corals and, and probably not around here. Um, but, but if, if you, as you go to depth, uh, the colors start to disappear, right? You, you first you lose the, the reds and the yellows, and pretty soon after you, you get down to 30 meters or whatever, it's all blue down there. And that's only the top part of the ocean. Um, the, the oceans on the average are, are four kilometers deep. Um, and, and so if you can go 30 meters into the water, you, you're barely uh, scratching the surface. The, the oceans are, are very, very deep and very, very cold. Um, this is a diagram of the layers of the ocean. Here's the surface and here's, sorry, it was a US talk, so 13,000 feet, you, you can do the math probably. Um, so uh, there's the South Pole and there's the North Pole and there's the equator. And basically what happens is that the sun beats on the surface of the ocean and it absorbs all that light in the top 100 meters or so and that warms the water. And warm water is buoyant, so it floats like a cork, like a raft. Uh, on the top of the ocean, and, and the vast bulk of the ocean, um, more than 90% of the mass of the ocean is at about three degrees Celsius. Doesn't matter where you go. I mean, even, even at, in Tahiti, uh, down below uh, 1,000 meters, it's three degrees Celsius. Um, a little bit of water can, can get cold enough at the poles every year to become heavier than the deep water, and so it sinks. So the deep water is actually formed at the poles in the wintertime, if you sort of think about you know, Antarctica in July or something like that. Uh, you wouldn't want to be there, but it gets cold enough that that water can actually sink to depth, and about one one-thousandth of the mass of the ocean undergoes that process every year. So one, one one-thousandth of the ocean is, is uh, sunk down to Davy Jones' locker, yeah, you know, every, every year. Um, the surface water is equilibrated with the atmosphere. The deep water is incredibly slow to form, so that big intermediate water, that, that water doesn't know we're here yet. That water hasn't touched the atmosphere since the high middle ages. 
uh, the, the vast bulk of the, of the ocean has no dissolved uh, anthropogenic chemicals in it. it, it, it it's pristine, hasn't, hasn't touched the atmosphere in a really long time. People have gone and measured it. Um, I feel sorry for these people. This is a rosette. They, they had to spend months and months on these ships. See all these little dots? You think they're lines, but they're actually dots um, 50 kilometers apart. And at every one of those dots, uh, they dropped these rosettes to the bottom of the ocean and, and brought them back up and did the chemistry. Uh, so these are some results from those experiments. These actually show um, anthropogenic CO2. This is the Atlantic, this is the Indian Ocean, this is the Pacific. The, the, the interaction with uh, fossil fuel CO2 is very shallow. It's only the top few hundred meters. And this great big bulk of the ocean is, is I insulated, isolated, whatever. It's physically not touching the atmosphere, so it has no anthropogenic CO2. And it takes a really, really long time. It takes a thousand years to turn this over once. And if you want it to come into equilibrium, you gotta turn it three times. Like the e-folding time is, is a thousand years, so it's like 3,000 years to, to become well mixed. Um, so where is all the carbon gone? I, I already kind of went through this. Into the oceans, um, the solubility mechanism that I already discussed about uh, carbonic acid, but also biology takes CO2, um, bicarbonate out of the surface water, and some of that material sinks uh, into Davy Jones' locker through, through um, just physical settling. Uh, that's the biological pump. On the land, we got CO2 fertilization. We got nitrogen deposition. We got regrowth of forests, and we have boreal warming. Unfortunately, of these processes, the ocean processes are pretty good. The ocean processes are like thousand year processes. If, if you were trying to get rid of CO2 to prevent global warming, the oceans is kind of where you want to put it. Ma maybe you'd really better not burn it in the first place, but if you had to get rid of it, um, putting it in the oceans is, is kind of a stable reservoir because they don't turn over. The land, not so much. Uh, the CO2 fertilization effect is good because we're not going to run out of CO2 anytime soon, but if you put you know, if you put uh, miracle Grow on your tomato plants in your garden, um, they'll grow faster. But if you put 10 times more miracle Grow on your tomato plants, you're not gonna grow 10 times more tomatoes, right? You're, you're gonna kill them. And, and if you put more nitrogen than they can use, the, the nitrogen just pees out the bottom and, and you, don't, you don't get any extra growth out of it. So nitrogen fertilization has sort of a limited shelf life. Land use change, you only get uh, a sink out of regrowing forests while they're regrowing. Right? Once they've become mature for us, then they're dying as fast as they're growing again, and that's no longer a sink. So, you know, cutting down the trees and then uh, sending your, your grandchildren to, to work in, in town, sure, you get your woodlot to grow back, but then eventually your woodlot becomes an old forest and, then, and it's no longer sucking up CO2. And boreal warming is probably the worst place to put it because if, if you warm up the, the Arctic a little bit, you can move the tree line up in, into the tundra, but if you warm it up a whole bunch more, you're gonna thaw the permafrost, and then you're in a world of hurt because you got all this carbon that's frozen, and it's like you unplug the freezer and the meat goes bad, right? So the, the, the stuff that was, was frozen winds up being accessible to microbes, and, and pretty soon you got, uh, you got a, a bunch of problems. So, so we worry about um, sink saturation. Maybe I already said all this. O only the CO2 fertilization really has legs uh, as a land sink, and these other things are sort of transients. Um, the ocean is kind of safe for the near term, but kind of scary for the long term. So I want to talk a little bit about longer term. So imagine that the atmosphere is a big bathtub and there's 800 billion tons of carbon in the bathtub. And we've got the global economy, you know, fill, filling 10 billion tons a year of carbon into the bathtub. And thankfully, we got a couple of leaks in the bottom of the tub, right? We've got the oceans that are draining off about 25% of this carbon into the, into the ocean. We got the land, for whatever reason, taking off another 25%. So we got an accumulation rate of the carbon in the tub by about five uh, gigatons a year. Now, the, the killer with global warming is that the warming isn't actually uh, a, a function of the faucet. It's not a function of the flow. It's a function of the stock. It's a function of the total amount of carbon in the atmosphere. So. Uh, M making it go down is not the same as turning down the tap, right? Yes, you should ride the bus. Yes, you should turn off lights when you leave the room. But that's just this tiny, tiny little reduction of the flow. What, what you got to do to make the level in the tub go down is, is turn off the faucet, right? This, this is not going to go away with, with small marginal measures. So there's a worse problem, which is that the drains in the bottom of the tub, they're not connected to the sewer. 
The, the drains in the bottom of the tub, there's sort of three drains, okay? This is a little more complicated. This is, but it's, it can't be that bad. It's from National Geographic, okay? So, um, <laughs> so, so, so this great big drain, that's going into the plants and soils. And it's going there fast, right? Whatever we've done to the biosphere through CO2 fertilization, nitrogen fertilization, letting the trees grow back in Vermont, all that kind of stuff, is taking carbon out of the atmosphere at a pretty, pretty good clip. Um, but there's, there's not a very big septic tank connected to that drain. There's only so much extra biomass you can grow on the planet. I mean, think about it. Uh, in order to put carbon permanently in the, in, the, in the land, you basically have to grow forests where there aren't currently forests, okay? You, you already got forests in the Amazon. You, you're not gonna make twice as much forest in the Amazon. It's already, it's already full. Uh, you're not gonna put forests in the Sahara because there ain't any water, right? You can't grow forests in the Sahara or Greenland. Uh, there are places in the world that could grow trees that don't have trees. Do you know what we call those places? Farms. Th th that's where we grow our food. So there's really a pretty limited uh, reservoir to stick carbon on the land. It's got to go into the deep ocean. The deep ocean has a huge capacity, but it's drip, drip, drip. It's this one, one thousandth of the ocean per year that has the, the cold uh, negative buoyancy to be able to, to, to sequester in the bottom of the ocean. Ultimately, it's got to go into the rocks from whence it came. It's got to go uh, through, through chemical reactions to become minerals. Now, this is geology. This takes freaking forever. This is very slow, but the, the reservoir is essentially infinite. That's the, the geologic reservoir. So here's the bad news. Uh, this is not a simulation. This isn't really a, a prediction by any stretch. It's a what if. It's a back of the envelope. Please don't take it too seriously. This is the year, calendar year. And you probably haven't seen very many calendar year plots that go out to the year 40,000 AD. But if you think of time, uh, well, the year 2018, um, and you release this massive pulse of fossil fuel CO2, and you allow it to come into chemical equilibrium with the oceans, there's actually a rather rapid, on this time scale, uh, chemical reaction with the oceans. It takes about three turns of the thermohaline circulation to, to reach chemical equilibrium with, with the uh, ocean bicarbonate reservoir. Uh, so that's like the year 5,000. After that, you still got 20% of that CO2 left in the atmosphere, and now you have a uh, reaction with limestone. Now this is geologic, but it's relatively fast. The limestone is, is quite strongly reactive with the ocean water, and that takes you out to about the year 20,000 AD, and now you're down to about 10 or 12% of the fossil pulse remaining in the atmosphere, and now you gotta wait for igneous rocks to, to dissolve um, and, and literally bring down the mountains to, to do that. The last time that a big pulse of CO2 like this hit the atmosphere was about 56 million years ago during the Paleocene or Eocene thermal maximum, and it took about 100,000 years for that pulse to, to go away. So there's a large fraction, well, not, not large, it's, it's on the order of 10% of this perturbation that, that has geologic time scale to, to get rid of it. Uh, 100,000 years from now, we, there'll still be CO2 in the atmosphere that, that was burned in your car this afternoon. Uh, so here's my summary. CO2 in the atmosphere cycles very vigorously with huge pools of carbon, both the land and the ocean. Um, growth and death have been almost perfectly balanced over geologic time, with a tiny, tiny residual accumulating in fossil fuels over a half a billion years it took to, to create the fossil fuel reservoirs. And we have burned through about 40% of that half billion year fossil reservoir in 200 years. Amazing. We, we have been busy little beavers. Um, small changes in the land and the ocean carbon cycle now suck up about 50% of all fossil fuel. It's a wonderful service that the world provides to us by reducing the effective emissions rate of CO2 by 50%. Um, but unfortunately, those carbon sink processes will saturate over time. Over decades, over centuries, we will run out of sink. Um, and some of that fossil fuel will be our, our legacy in the geologic record for hundreds of centuries after we're gone. Thank you very much.